Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I see you're reading the National you're... Enquirer, Mickey. I am. Uh, he... I was I was hoping for the Steve Bing was murdered edition. No, you're way ahead. It. You're way ahead of even the National Enquirer on that one. What does it say on the cover? There? No, they, well, this is last week's issue. This is all they had on the newsstand. It says Epstein's Epstein's, Epstein's chilling prison confessions, which are not that chilling. But well, what uh, are they? What did he say? Oh, he said he he knew a bunch Re- of famous regrets. I've got a few, something like that. And people, were, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. He said he this this is the 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 alleged quadruple murderer who was sharing his cell and and said uh, that Epstein said people were out to kill him, so would he help him commit suicide? Which doesn't make any sense. Like, well, why not just let the people kill you if you're going to commit suicide? <laughs> well, they might but, not do a clean job of it. I can um, see that. I sympathize there. But, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't, all doesn't, doesn't really make sense. So this, uh, does this mean we're starting off with Epstein? I mean, we've got, you know, we've got bad news on the COVID front. We've got the continued unraveling of the very fabric of American society. We've got the related war on cancel culture as manifest in a now infamous and famous letter to Harper and Harper's, right. and we're gonna and we're gonna lead with with tabloidy stuff. Is that what you're telling us? Well, I I want to talk about the tabloid stuff at one point, but we I thought we could get out of the way quickly. Okay. No, I've got a little more to say on Epstein. I think we should save it until we've really it's built a, up some momentum. It's not an Epstein story. It's a Bing story. And all I have to say is, there's <laughs> this guy committed suicide. And the press hasn't followed up on, except for Kim Masters, and um, uh, the the Inquirer story was interesting because. It did not take – this guy jumped out of the 27th floor of his apartment in this is, near, this is near Bing. Beverly Hills. Yeah. And uh, Bing. And uh, my speculation was they found Jelaine Maxwell right. by looking at Which his seemed to me book. like – seemed to me com- completely this, crazy, but go ahead. The Inquirer has – sort of accepts that there's an Epstein-Bing connection and says uh, – but doesn't say that what you'd expect, which is – that uh, Bing was killed by the same people that killed Epstein because they were worried he'd spill the secrets. No, they go on a completely different tangent. They said that Bing had already spilled his guts to the FBI and he was killed by another gang that was upset that Epstein was killed. So somehow in reaction, they bilked Bing and Bing was depressed. It's it's sort of a, it, it doesn't quite make sense. The, the The truth content is deeply suspect. Hmm. One of the, uh, the, uh, part of the evidence for this conspiracy was that there were your Euro- Middle Eastern men in well, well cut suits smoking and talking outside his apartment building. Well, if you've ever walked by his apartment building, which I do all the time because I work in Century City, uh, there are always Middle Eastern men smoking and talking. This is Beverly Hills. That's what happens in Beverly Hills. So, um, once again, you're not, you're ahead of the rest of the media on this story, that was Mickey. Not, that was Only not, you have that angle. Anyway, but um, I had some. Uh, oh, it, it, I think it may I be have, a. It may I have be a, a theory. I have a theory about who killed Epstein, but we'll save it for the end. Go ahead. It, it may be a Jan. It's my one. It may be a Jan Masaryk situation. Are you familiar with Jan Masaryk? Mm, East He's a, East German Czech. something Czech. Czech. He's yeah, the the um, I believe his father was the founder of Czechoslovakia, Thomas Masryk. There's a statue of him uh, near DuPont Circle. Uh, mm. He was the son, and after the war, he went back to Czechoslovakia as a liberal Democrat and discovered that the communists were taking over, and he was defenestrated from a second-story window. Uh, and what was curious is... <laughs> Remind is, our younger viewers what defenestrated means. Thrown out the window. <laughs> the um, uh, he um, he, his age swore that he wasn't killed; that he was depressed. Mm-hmm. Okay, bizarrely, you think they would say, "Oh, the communists killed him." No, his aide said, "No, he was so," de- but he was depressed because the communists were about to kill him. <laughs> so that would make you depressed too. So it may. Everybody swears that being committed suicide because he was depressed. The question is, why, why he was depressed? he depressed? It might be a mixture. As always. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. 
No, I, I, I do want to wait until the end to spring my theory. It's, it's, I'm probably not the first, but it's an, it's an emphasis that hasn't been there in, in, in mm. looking at who would have had an incentive to, uh, kill Epstein. But, but meanwhile, we can rest assured that the truth will come out because the woman who knows everything has been put in a federal prison in New York City. So I'm what sure nothing will go wrong. What could be safer? And they have a security camera trained on her 24 hours a day. So, I mean, she's totally secure. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the New York prisons are known for the maintenance of their video cameras, as I recall. This is another hellhole prison that is apparently... It's in Brooklyn. Has a, yeah, has a long history of uh, corrupt guards. And, and, and it's also... This is the angle that only blogging heads has, Bob. It, it, there's, it's infested with a gang. Two different gangs, not the same gang as controlled the Epstein prison. But when gangs are running the joint, there's a chance they're going to kill you and not just beat you up in the prison yard, but, you know, maybe do something worse like sneak into your cell and kill you. Anyway, uh, I'm not at all confident that she will survive. It seems insane. They should have her at some remote location by herself. Uh, it's crazy to throw her in with the general population. I will, I will, by the end of this episode, give you more cause for concern. And if that isn't enough to keep them listening. Okay, this, is, this is the teaser. This okay. is the tease. This You're is like a, a master. Tease. You're a master. I am, I am. This is okay. what got me where I am. <laughs> okay. Today. Back so, to your agenda. Sorry. Okay. So, so, uh, on COVID quickly, I mean, I think there is genuinely bad news, right? Like, well, the deaths are ticking the up. The deaths, it's, it's clear now. I mean, they were kind of still declining. There was this increasingly mysterious gap between new cases and new deaths. But the last three days, I think, were pretty unequivocal. In fact, when we taped last week, as of the day before, I still have, I haven't seen today's numbers because the site I follow doesn't uh, publish them until later in the day. But as of last week when we taped, the seven day rolling average for deaths was 495 per day. Now, the seven day average is 584. That is a big spike for a seven day average. And so, uh, I think, um, I am now feeling slightly more alarmed than I was last week. The, um, you know, Derek Thompson in the Atlantic finally wrote the piece that I had been saying somebody in the media should write, which is just take, take this seriously. The fact that the deaths had not been increasing and try to look at the possible reasons for the gap between that and the new cases. I mean, and, you know, the I think a reason that mainstream media wasn't really tackling it head on is because they didn't want to emphasize the decline in deaths in the first place because the headlines had to be optimally anti-Trump and the way to right. do that. So the, uh, Josh Marshall wrote a similar piece. What did he say? I mean, I, after reading the Derek Thompson piece, I'm, I'm proud to say, with all the humility... I don't think somebody reading it would know much more than they would have known if they had been listening to us. Again, with all due humility, what did Josh Marshall say about... Uh, Actually, I forget. He talked about... the. He, he had a chart showing that some states had rising positivity rates, but other states didn't. Uh, well, that's certainly true. But uh, uh, I forget why that was ex- explanatory. And he was, he was... It was written before the California deaths started climbing, so it talked about how California was an anomaly... California is not an anomaly anymore. And as Jonas Sarah points out, do they give Governor Newsom grief? No, because he's a Democrat. They give grief to the uh, Republican senators of Florida and Arizona and Texas. Republican governors. Governors, sorry. So, yeah. um, but, uh, but what's your, what's your, what, what, well, of the explanations that Thompson trotted out, I mean, it was the usual suspects, including one I had emphasized, which they're getting better at treating it. They're, and, and, and that is definitely part of it. Um, but one that I think you had brought to our attention, uh, is when you think about it alarming, which is that, um, the population that's, that's been coming down with COVID has been younger than the population was a couple of months ago. And if that's the case, that explains why not a lot of them are dying, but it also suggests that as, as the disease migrates through the population and they infect, uh, older people, we'll start to have trouble, and that could be part of what's it, what's happening. It, it could also be a milder strain. We don't know. A milder, well, there, more infectious strain. Now, there is but, that. I, I listened to a podcast, uh, The Daily, and this time I'm not going to heap disdain on The Daily. We've, we've done that already. Uh, it can be illuminating. They had their, their one of their main 
and and most veteran uh, health reporters, uh, McNeil, is it Donald McNeil Jr. or something? I don't know. And and he was saying, and now he is a total alarmist in general. I will say you should discount for that. Um, but but he was actually saying something not alarming, which is that there's some reason to think it, it, it the virus has been evolving. It's pretty s- speculative, but has been evolving both toward uh, lower lethality and uh, higher transmissibility. Right. And um, you know if that is happening uh lower lethality is good and at this point let's face it i mean we're, we're headed for either either herd immunity or, or 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 herd immunity through a vaccine so you you could even argue that i mean certainly i'd say that if if it's to the extent that the virus becomes more transmissible less lethal that strengthens the argument for herd immunity as a strategy because the cost and deaths of pursuing herd immunity uh decreases and the economic um, the economic cost of, uh, of shutdown increases because you've got to do more shutting down to stop it if it's more transmissible. So, uh, you know. The, the, right. But the deaths are rising. So obviously it's lethal enough. Although the deaths are still at a much lower well, level than they were when New York was recording a thousand deaths a day. Oh, totally. Yeah. So they're, um, they're way lower, but. but but they do seem here, clearly headed up. But here's my question. People are wondering why, what's the point of the, you know, we're a long way f- from herd immunity, according to the studies I've seen. We're at like five or 10%, and the lowest I've seen for herd immunity is like 30% if you assume that all the right people have immunity. Uh, so I, I, I just think that we're, so, the experts are telling us don't think about getting to herd immunity anytime soon. And, what, what I want to know is what, what's then to be gained? You know, we, are we just waiting for the vaccine? So are, is the idea that we just lower the spread as much as possible until sometime next year when we get out of this and there's a vaccine? Or is there something, some intermediate goal? In New York, the deaths have gone practically to zero. So why is that? Is that the goal to be like New York and get the deaths close to zero? They are, they aren't doing especially uh, especially serious social distancing anymore, are they? So what are they, what are they doing? Well, this is a mystery to me. Why is well, New think, York down? I think the mask culture probably did take hold in New York in a way that it's only starting to take hold in some parts of the country. But I also think there is this thought that New York City is, well, it's definitely closer to herd immunity than anywhere else. Uh, they think that maybe, uh, 20, 25% have antibodies, but there's also this idea that there may be another chunk of the population that has a different kind of immunity coming from these things called like T memory cells or something. It's a yeah. different, uh, and, and those wouldn't show up in antibody tests. And some people are speculating that the, the actual immunity in New York City could be, uh, more than 40% of the population, which they, would, would significantly slow yeah, yeah, the spread have, of the virus. Cause they have, they have T cells left over from the SARS-1. That no, I think to work a lot slightly against the SARS two. My understanding, I could be wrong. My understanding had been that uh, it's just a different kind of legacy of having gotten the disease this time around, perhaps without realizing, it, been infected, uh, perhaps without realizing uh, it. But I could be wrong. But it's basically, it's I guess it's kind of like you don't have the troops roaming the country where troops are the antibodies, you know, yeah. but you do have. You, you you remember what happened in the last invasion. You know what the enemy's like, and that information is registered in right. these cells, so that I guess antibodies can be dispatched more. Qu- I don't know. Right. I, I should stop talking. I have no right. idea. But so so anyway, New York holds out some hope that there's some some goal short of just waiting for a vaccine or herd immunity, or maybe because they, they they've achieved herd immunity. I guess. Well, there are but, things that are prophylactic but not vaccines there's that there's better uh success at treating um people now there is uh, this story was splashed on the front page of the wall street journal so maybe it's significant this this german biotech firm uh says it's optimistic about having a vaccine ready for approval in december um and uh that would be good news and you'll be happy to hear mickey that uh this company was founded in 2008 by two Turkish immigrants. So, 
I, I, I guess it's a, it's a good thing that Donald Trump wasn't running Germany in 2008, since immigrants from Muslim countries might not have been welcome. Sorry, that was a cheap shot. But it's true... And, and they they are like partnering with Pfizer, which I guess would market the American version of the vaccine. Um, um, there, this, of course, is colliding with Black Lives Matter. There's some guidelines that show because the disease disproportionately affects people of color, that people of color should have first shot at the vaccine. Although why you'd want first shot at the vaccine, I don't quite know. You might end up like Jonathan Edwards. But Ooh, um, good memory there. But uh but uh, I, I, my attitude to the vaccine is you go first. But um, <laughs> yeah, but they're doing the old fashioned kinds of trials where they give it to thousands of people. So there yeah. will be a lot of laboratory rats. I mean, yeah. I think there should be more argument for, uh, you know, w- this thing we discussed. I forget the name, but it's where uh, rather than give it to thousands of people and just wait and see how many are infected, you give it to a much smaller number of people and infect and, and, and just expose yeah. them to the damn virus. Uh, there's, I think there's a strong utilitarian case for that, but I'm not hearing much about it. You, you would get to market faster with a vaccine, and I think no more people would die in the process, probably, uh, almost certainly, um, and almost nobody would die in the process, because you, you start out by giving it to young people who aren't, you know, are almost certainly not going to die. Anyway, I, I digress. One thing that's happening here is, uh, and you know, the, the old rule is three is a trend, yeah. but on the internet, it's modified. You have to, if you don't go off at two, you're going to be too late. So I, I only have two examples of this, not three. But, uh, basically what happened is, is I live on the west side of LA. Very few people here. I, I don't know anybody who has it. It doesn't seem especially a pressing problem. It's heavily concentrated in the Latino and black areas on toward, further toward the east. But people on the west side have started to uh, uh, let their nannies and maids come back, and the nannies and maids are coming back and uh, and are starting to bring the virus with them. Is there uh, evidence that they're bringing it with, with them? I have two. I have uh, two. two. Two examples, anecdotes? but I need three. And you're saying but, that by the modern rules of journalism, you're allowed to write a piece on the basis of two anecdotes? By my rules. No, you're allowed to talk about it on the Internet. It, it used to be that if you had two examples, you couldn't write the piece at all. If you had three, that was overwhelming right, proof. Right, right, And I claim on, in the, on the web, if you don't go off at two, you're too late. Okay. So um, anyway, it, it's sort of comeuppance for the rich West Side white people who can't stand to live without their maids and nannies that uh, – that, this is proving a, 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 a karma-like uh, uh, return of the virus, uh, overcoming class distinctions. Uh, it's just something that it, it, it also amazes me that people on the West Side can't live without their maids and nannies. I mean, if you looked around this place, you would see well, that I, I can need see a maid, that, but I can I've see the nanny. One. I can see the nannies part. I mean, I, I mean, I don't have young kids anymore, but as I recall, if you were suddenly, and I mean, we never sent ours to summer camp anyway, so summer wouldn't have been any different for us. Well, we probably sent them to uh, organized activities of a kind that aren't happening right now. But anyway, I've heard a lot of about people being driven crazy by their. It's actually there's actually a big push among kind of progressive elites who are being driven who can't get any work done i mean chris hayes michelle goldberg i heard ross douthat second michelle's uh notion on uh her motion on uh on the podcast they do together um because they're all they've all got young kids and 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 they're going nuts can't get any work done and they want schools to open and they're upset that nobody's talking about how to intelligently open schools and well, that's run, that's run into two snags as far as I can see. Uh, one, the teachers are scared. And two, half the parents are not like Ross, uh, and Michelle and are scared to send their kids to school. Right. So it, it, it's turning into a huge well, Donnybrook. I'm sure they would like to have it both ways. I'm sure they'd like the schools to be safe, but I, I, I just gotta think it's very hard to, come anywhere near guaranteeing that there won't be transmission in the schools. When, when you look at the science, it, there's not a lot of evidence that the kids are a special danger. It's n- there, it, there's not much reason to think they are at risk, uh, and there's not much. I, I've heard lately that there's not even a lot of evidence that they do a lot in the way of transmission. Right, right. Uh, that, that seemed clear a few weeks ago. So, now easy for us to say. I mean, you know, when you've got kids, 
right. as I recall, um, you're you're kind of highly attuned to even uh, low risk bad outcomes. Um, and, 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 and the, the weird thing about this disease is, is those don't stop at death and we don't know exactly what they are. I'm, I'm kind of amazed at the, at the general lack of reliable information about this, given how far we are into it. There's so many, uh, so many things that uh, people can't tell you with much confidence. So, um, including I, the, including the brain consequences. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, what, what was what was next? Uh, that was a that was an alarmingly long silence. Maybe we've both been infected, and we've seen the brain consequences. Um, it seems like a lot of bizarrely defying class nor class uh, stereotypes. A lot of politicians are getting this. The mayor of Atlanta, John Huntsman, Bolsonaro, uh, the, the Bolsonaro. Um, I, I didn't know. You know. I didn't know Huntsman got it. Yeah, he not only got it, then he lost his race, so that was depressing for him. Um, uh, but uh, is that just because they glad hand? They can't afford not to go out and meet people, and they. I guess that's it. It's certainly harder to, you know. Um, but I don't know. Good thing, course, I lo- good thing I lost my Senate campaign. Yeah, yeah, I'd you would be. A, you would be at risk if you were if you were a minority leader right now. Oh, that's a, that's like, right. You ran as a Democrat. That's the amazing thing. That's like um, that, that's not so amazing. It's like um, at Newsweek we wrote a at Newsweek we once wrote a story that knocked Joe Biden out of the nineteen eighty eight presidential campaign, and he then got an aneurysm, but was happened to be near a hospital, so he survived. And I called up my mother and said. I saved Joe Biden's life because if he, we hadn't knocked him out of the race, uh, he would have had the aneurysm on the road in New Hampshire and wouldn't have been near a hospital and it would have been, he would have been in deep trouble. And my mother said, you're really full of yourself, aren't you? <laughs> so that was, what your are mother mothers was, for? Your mother was great. <laughs> Am I imagining that your mother had a British accent? I'm not, right? No, she had a slight British accent, which was bizarre since. She was an American born in Germany, but, um. She had a very regal air. I would have, she, I would have done she anything she herself, said. She, she went to Beedale's boarding school for a few years. Uh-huh. And, and, and that took, and she saw herself as an English woman. This explains the high degree of white privilege you have, which is higher than mine, I might add, but I'm, I don't want to go there right now. We haven't turned to that part of the conversation. Um. um so, but wait, quickly on Biden, uh, do you know anything about this woman, Karen Bass, that George Will is advancing as the African-American member of Congress whom Biden should select as vice president? She's God, from your no. neck of the woods. She's from Southern California. You know, in, 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 you know in, in my media cocoon, she's a horrible, horrible, uh, her politics are horrible. She's not a horrible person, but she's a... Which means I would like know. her. No, I mean, she's a Democratic... Uh, mainstream machine politician. Imagine that in a um, vice presidential candidate. That sounds good so far. Does she have any downsides? I mean... I don't know. Hmm. The answer is I don't know. I'm sorry. Karen Bass. Remember the name. Um, that means she, that means she'll be president soon. So you have to watch. You have to, uh, make this selection very, uh, very, very carefully. I'm, I was hoping, I'm still hoping, that Trump somehow gets knocked out of the race quickly before he has the chance to uh, lead his party to a humiliating defeat. The, the defects are still there. Maybe he's bottomed out in the polls, but, you know, he has Jared Kushner running his campaign, who's mediocre at best, has this insane idea that he's going to somehow woo minority voters, uh, uh, you know, to, to to Trump as opposed to emphasizing you know, the good things about Trump that ma- might attract people in the middle. And he's also, he, Trump can't hire anybody else, even if he wanted to, who is better than Jared, because Jared isn't going anywhere. He's unfireable. And Jared will wa- have a war against whoever's there. So why would anybody take that job just to fight with Jared? So Trump is, is, he's sort of hardwired for doom at this point. I have a theory that Steve Bannon is worming his way back into influence within the campaign. Well, it sure seems that way. Although, I don't, did he get points for saying that, you know, B- Biden came out with this, uh, buy America 
sort of tint on his platform. Oh, Bannon and, and was Bi- going nuts Bi- about that today. And he Biden- was so pissed off that Biden, because there's been this Trump executive order drafted by your friend Peter Navarro floating around that they haven't issued, right? There's a, it's in draft form, and they haven't gotten around to issuing it. And according to Bannon, Biden stole all the ideas from it for this Buy America announcement. Um, that could be, but, it, you know... Um they, as somebody pointed out, they've issued four or five by America executive orders. I mean, what, so this would just be another one. And Biden could have, and Biden could have stolen from them too. You know, and the executive orders did not have a big impact before. Part of the problem with Trump is that instead of achieving anything, he issues vacuous executive orders. There was a vacuous executive order about Hispanic prosperity. It was like a parody of a hack interest group campaign. Hey, let's have this event where we talk about this meaningless executive order advancing the, the, the uh, you know, the prosperity of the Hispanic community. It, it was totally stupid. And the, the Buy America thing would probably be more of the same. I mean, he needs legislation, and he's been completely it, 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 incapable of passing any legislation. From what I gather, it's stuff like manufacture, you know, protective equipment. A lot of it's COVID-related, like manufacture protective equipment domestically and then stockpile it so we won't be dependent on China do some pharmaceutical stuff, uh, study supply chains to see if they're vulnerable. It, it sounds like not a ton of it's high, really concrete stuff. I, I'm, I'm glad that Biden has this uh, this nationalist uh, tilt to his, uh, you know, trade policy. I wish he had it on his immigration policy. The immigration plan, he, he came out with his unity plan with uh, Bernie Sanders. Right. And... Um, I, 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 it, it seems to call for an amnesty of 11 million. And I guess the hope, uh, the, the hope on my side is, well, maybe Biden's not quite as bad as we thought because I, I, I didn't see a, a massive influx of new legal immigrants. But, uh, and I guess the hope is also that maybe he can be, uh, bullied into taking some, uh, in order to get elected, taking some conservative position more conservative position on immigration and also that once once congress you know it's suppose he wins and gets a majority in the senate once the senate has to actually vote on it where it actually will take effect uh it will prove to be less popular but it, it seems to me that all those are completely weak reads uh the, the his plan will move to the left the senate passed it before they they'll pass it again they passed it before, before with a filibuster proof majority I'll pass it again this time with a at least a majority if you uh, if you get rid of the filibuster and we're doomed. It seems if Biden wins and the Democrats win the Senate, my side is doomed. Because you think amnesty is death for your whole cause, because once you send the signal that you will grant amnesty, even though nominally you say, but this is it. Next round of uh, of illegal or, immigrants doesn't get it. That you think nobody believed that, so they continue to come across the border, right? That's your whole well, basically, because we said that once before. We in nineteen eighty six, we right. said, okay, here's an amnesty for three million. This is it. Instead, we got eleven million new illegals, and so if we say, okay, eleven million, this is it. Uh, no more after you. Who's going to believe that? You'd be an idiot to believe that. Uh, and a plus, plus, you know, new uh, new legal immigration including unskilled immigration, also bids down wages. And we're just looking at a country where uh, it's just much harder for people at the bottom of the income ladder to make a decent living uh, without massive government subsidies that probably can't be sustained and also sap human respect anyway. So uh, that's that's the fear. And the, the one encouraging thing is there's starting to be some voices on the left who are, who are skeptical of the democratic uh, immigration plan. They're still on the fringes, but at least it's not just uh, a few people. So, I, but in general, I think Trump is uh, heading for disaster, and I, I wish he would uh, decide to somehow uh, quit while he's ahead. Let's put it that way. So, you know what my evidence is that Bannon is uh, worming his way back into the campaign? First of all, you, you listen not- to the War Room podcast. That's a pretty persistent caller you've got there. I know. It may be the city calling to say that peaceful protesters are on the march. That's usually what it is. Could be. Jesus. Okay. This is like ring number 11. You should answer it and give them some kind of award for... Pers- Oop. They stopped. The, um, 
so first of all, there there used to you know this guy Jason Miller who used to work for Trump, right? Correct. He does. He works for Trump again now. Yeah, and he was on Bannon's podcast, and he was part of the messaging machine. He was part of the like Trump should do this, Trump should do that. They were all on the same page, and 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 now now Miller's actually working for them now. Obviously, they there would be risk associated with actually bringing Bannon back visibly, right? Because for one thing, Trump's got this whole thing about people think he's my puppet master. For another thing, I guess Jared would go berserk. But, you know, the other thing is, like, Bannon is no longer physically present at this podcast. He's always phoning in from somewhere, and he really needs to get better broadband, but that's that's another matter. But... For some reason, he's not on location. And it just seems like Trump's, like the uh, Mount Rushmore speech, for example, it was pretty Bannon-esque. And, and, uh, I just think they're, you know, and, the Mount Ru- d- yeah, go ahead. The Mount Rushmore speech was uh, another thing Trump is up against. He gives a speech. It, it was Bannon-esque, but it was not racially tinged. He, he cited only union victories. He invoked Martin Luther King. Uh, he venerated Lincoln. I didn't talk at all about Confederate symbols. The press completely ignored this and said, Trump wages racist campaign. Okay. That it shows that they're, well, not, they're, I, they're determined that he not get a single good news day. That I, was, I think that so. was unbelievable. That was a, an extra step in the berserking. Of Did the all press. of them say racist? They emphasized the divisiveness of it. And there was that part of it where Trump said the left is coming. The cultural revolution is coming. There's, you know, whatever. There's chaos in the streets. Well, he criticized and gonna... Black Lives Matter. Well, that sounds a little racially tinged, right? Well, it, 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 it's racially tinged, but, but, the, but the Washington Post emphasized the preservation of Confederate statues, which he did not emphasize or even mention. Yeah, the, the, the um, post the post thing was was remarkable. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I've been keeping some examples of dubious uh, coverage. Um, by newspapers, but maybe I'll save those for later if I can find them. The, um, but, uh, but it was, but, but, but this is, but, but, but the basic, like, these, the left, the, the left, Antifa is coming, the socialists are coming, that's Bannon's, like, central, that's his rallying cry right now, and that really was the heart of the Rushmore speech, because the, the part that was ignored was, of course, ignored. It, it was Dog Bites Man. The, 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 you know, the anodyne stuff you say in a Fourth of July sp- speech, nobody, no good journalist is going to lead with that. That's what presidents always say on the Fourth of July. You could have written a story saying Trump shifts from racial focus to uh, more neutral terms. And you could even say he's trying to avoid his dog whistle to the to to the racist right well, you, could, you could even say that they didn't bother to say that they just lied okay, about well, maybe they could say maybe they should have said trump shifts from uh, racial division except for the part about black lives matter and moves toward ideological division warning of impending uh, apocalypse at the hands of the anarchist left which would have been i think fair the it's- Sure, is, that would have been, that would have been totally fair, but and it's not. That's not enough to win a presidency. <laughs> well, we'll see. That, Did you see the Trojan horse ad? No. <laughs> it came out today. Uh, it's uh, they took some movie where there was the Trojan horse. This is a Trump ad, and uh, the idea is Biden is the Trojan horse, and inside of him are these dangerous socialists inside the horse. Poised to spring out and destroy your society are people like AOC and uh, Bernie Sanders. And the, and the funny thing is, it's I don't think this is intentional for comic effect. It's just so badly done. It's like computer graphics exist now such that you could do this smooth, cool job of that. Like it really kind of looks like like you didn't just cut and paste Biden's face and <laughs> onto the horse. It's it's quite something. Um, but there's, I think that I, I don't think there's any. I don't think it's necessarily true that a slick political ad is more effective than a crude ad. Sometimes the crude ads are just as effective. They get the point across, and people aren't giving you yeah, awards no, for our it, direction. Look, if all this is about is turn out your base, if that's the strategy, yeah. this may not be but, terrible. Oh, but wait, one thing: the, the the Lincoln Project. Did you see the one where? You know, Lincoln Project are these never Trump Republicans, veterans of past Republican presidential, and they, and, and they buy like 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 
fifty dollars worth of ads and they get a hundred million dollars worth of free publicity. Yeah, it's on brilliant. The but, but and I and I'm not that impressed with most of them. But did you see the one that that seems designed exclusively to actually drive Trump over the edge? They're all designed to drive. No, Trump no, no. Over no. The this edge. is totally different. This is like. They're talking about you. There's this whisper voice. Yeah. They're talking about you. It's it's like they're just. It's a frontal assault on too, on his sanity. <laughs> uh, they get way too much press, but uh, he may be close to the edge. Who knows? Um, uh, there, there's a difference between saying Biden's not going to be in charge and saying the people who are going to run the show are way left. I mean, I think the people who run the show are going to be Tony Blinken. Uh, Who's not way left, but uh, right. you 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 read you re- you read Biden's platform and you don't get the impression he's gone way to the left. You get the impression he's a dreary restoration of the status quo, which was inadequate four years ago. That's the problem. The problem is it's all it reads like a oh boring, yeah, but America most Democratic, voters Democratic Party platform. It, it was it was uh, almost unreadable. Most Americans would give anything for dreariness right now. I mean, honestly, that's how we're we're just try reading this thing, and it may change your mind. If it if it puts me to sleep, that would be much better than the current situation. This is uh, this is here here are here are fifteen insufficient uh, ways to address the housing problem. Uh, that's it, it great. A, that's great. That I, that's I'm getting goosebumps. That's yeah, the great. best way to address the housing problem is to have people earn more income at the bottom so they can buy houses. That's oh what sure, Trump but I mean achieving. as an as an electoral st- strategy, saying boring stuff will work fine. People just want. I mean, Biden's great. You know, the great danger is that he's not. You know, it, it's, oh. it's just the thought that he can't even successfully give us a boring presidency because of the because of cognitive decline. By the way, on no. today's Bannon podcast, there was a a brilliant little. Uh, they had a guy on who said, you know, it was about this uh, this Buy America plan, and they're like, you know, this. I mean, first of all, Bannon is like. This isn't the real Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a globalist, and and he has been something of one, and that's true. And then the other guy chimes in and says, this is more evidence of cognitive decline. He doesn't remember what he actually believes. I thought that was smart. <laughs> that is smart. But um, uh, there's a contradiction because you say they just want to return to normalcy, but when they try to retake the Senate, they say, well, they don't want to just reelect the same old boring status quo Republicans. They want to reset in a new agenda. So they don't want normalcy. They want a new agenda. Uh, if they're going to uh, retake I, the Senate, it has to be to get something other than normalcy. If you want normalcy, you can well, vote for Tom Tillis. If they want to uh, retake the Senate, maybe. I, I'm just my main point is that unless something comes totally out of left field, the main, overwhelmingly, the main threat to Biden's candidacy is just Biden. It's just him having like 30 seconds of serious cognitive trouble at a debate or at some other, you know, live Tom, setting or something. Yeah, I thought it was surprising that Tom Friedman panicked about that as early as now. I guess he needed a column. <laughs> because it's only said, six months late, you mean? What, six months early? It's, it's three months early. As he's yeah, but everybody else Biden- has been saying it forever. No, but before they were saying Trump isn't going to debate, which is always bullshit. Uh even if Trump's oh, staff oh, yeah. himself so free- was saying it, now they're saying Biden shouldn't debate well, well, because uh, Biden uh, and, and Friedman came up with two like uh, bogus, uh, you know, demands that Trump release his tax returns and allow right. real time Bi- fact checking as an excuse for Biden getting right. out of the debate. He, he said Biden should demand that as a prerequisite. I don't for think debating. Biden can get out of the debate either. I think they, <clears throat> whoever doesn't show up for the debate takes too big a risk of losing. So they'll both show up. Oh yeah, no, I think I think he's got a debate. Um, the um, now are anyway. you? I I assume you've made contact with the Kanye West campaign because uh, I think their ideology is malleable, Mickey. I could. I, You're I in could, Southern uh, California. I could give them tips. You for probably how, to make, how far do you live from him? I could give them tips for how to make the ballot in California. You know, I did make the ballot. You've done that. You've gotten farther than he got. <laughs> he got. Uh, Dave Weigel had a, D- Dave Weigel is, he, he pr- produces this thing called the trailer. And the thing about Dave Weigel is he's just an incredible workaholic. I don't 
he produces this yeah. incredible amount of, of there, detailed reporting. There's several de- people like that. He's like he Matt did, Iglesias, except Matt is not a reporter. But there's several alarmingly oh, yeah, productive people but, in the but, world. Yes, and, but he's a reporter, and reporting's hard. And he, 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 you know, Kanye West, he's already blown it with like about a third of the states. He, he barely has enough to win an electoral majority if he won every state he could qualify for the ballot in. Uh, uh, but that's even, even that's going to be gone in a month and a week. So he has to get on, get it on it pretty quickly. Uh, I, I somehow don't think he's going to do it. But um, well, is I mean, one theory is this is just a way to promote his upcoming album, yeah, right? Yeah. But you know, the 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 I, you know the serious. There's always been a strain, not among Kanye West, but among, you know, serious, gangster rapper types. Uh, I don't think that's Kanye West. Maybe it is. Uh, the um, beats me. Uh, the they had a minister of public information. They, his welfare plan was actually similar to mine. It was like get rid of get rid of cash welfare is usurping the role of the male. Give give Wait, men jobs. Whose plan is this? This was like the the uh, director of policy for the Crips or something. It was, like, it was oh, like, I see. It was a actual gang uh, had a pretensions for having a political stance, and the political stance they were so far left that they were and so macho that they were right. Um, so there's always been a there's always been an advocacy for uh, jobs, not dole. Uh, so maybe you could push Kanye in that direction. I, 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 I know very little about Kanye. Uh, but I bet you don't live far from him, right? Where, where does he live? Just drop he lives by. Over, he lives over the hill, actually. Cold calling. He lives over the hill. I could stop by, mm-hmm. knock on his I door. Would. Um, the, um, we have other things to talk about. It's, it's, it's sort of related. There, Joel Kotkin had a pretty good, column about how the Black Lives Matter move, I mean, basically the Black Lives Matter movement, while everybody, you know, says nice things about it because they'll be tarred as racist if they don't, the actual reaction of people is is going to be uh, to get the hell away from, as far away from the cities that they control as possible. Now, and wait, is, is, is Joel Kotkin the one who's, who's like uh, always... Calling for the return of a world in which people sit on the stoops of their brownstones in Brooklyn and commune. He's, I he's, forget. Yeah, I, I, I think he, maybe. He's, he's, was, he's, did he used to be at New America? Everybody used to be at New America except That's for true. me, Bob. That's true. Um, we tried. The, we tried to get you. You tried. There. I was. In, I was. Turn. I was too old and insufficiently solution oriented. Yeah. Well. Uh, uh, I, I. You know. Too bad. At least I forgot that. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, in the sixties, there was a, there was a, you know, in the, sorry, in the, in the eighties when, when welfare was being reformed, there was all this effort on to, well, the problem is we gave people welfare and they stayed in the central cities and didn't get to the suburbs where the jobs were because the jobs had moved to the suburbs because firms wanted a clean field where they could build a new factory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Charles Murray made the point, which may have been valid. I said, no, they didn't move to the suburbs. To go for a clean field, they moved to the suburbs to get away from the people on welfare and have a new hiring pool. So it wasn't necessarily going to help the people on welfare to be able to move to the suburbs to get the jobs because the jobs were fleeing them. Uh, and I think whether or not he was right about that, we're, we're up for a replay where the jobs, as a result of Black Lives Matter, they move out of the central city. They were moving back. They're, they get the hell out now. We have a resurgence of the suburbs. Wait, because they're afraid of ongoing violent protests or what? Because there's no police, because, yeah, because there's no law and order, because there's they're hostile people, uh, and there's no government. This is a big uh, part of the ban. You know, part of the, uh, the, the, the jobs came back to the central city because the Giuliani's of the world had made the city safe again, and crime was down throughout America. If crime starts ticking back up, people are going to flee again. That's the that's the horror of. I don't uh, think it's just the Giuliani's of the world. I think things like smartphones had a huge impact on crime. You you just can't run up and grab somebody's purse if if if, if you're going to be on video. You, you know, I think there's a lot of things. But anyway, well, this we're is about a big, to have a, We're about to have a test of that in s- several cities in America, where their smartphones you, are a, su- a substitute for actual policemen. Well, I you need some. Po- you need the policemen to show up eventually. I mean. And uh, so anyway, yeah, this is a big Bannon theme, as you know. The city, it's America is falling apart. 
Uh, the So you think the police are actually going on de facto strikes in a number of cities, basically? De facto works, yes. slowdowns? And, yes. and, 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 letting, enough, a lot of and letting enough people get killed so that everybody gets to the point that we need police? I don't know if it's a... If it's conspiratorial like that, it could be. What else would it, it be? be? Just, I mean, the, the, well, it the, could I, just be a reaction. Screw you. I'm just going to phone it in and not, not a sense of uh, screw you. And then, then the, then the spikes are going to rise and they're going to increase our budget. And then I'll go back to work. It just screw you. Uh, it's hard to believe it wouldn't have a tactical dimension. I mean, um, but, uh, yeah. Um, so it, it, I, I don't quite know. I mean, Trump is president. He's not doing anything about it. Why is that enough to reelect him? I mean, uh, for well, all we but know, he can Biden, say, no, but Biden, the line Biden is, might be more effect, Biden might be more effective at bringing Democratic mayors back in a line. Well, maybe, but the point, Trump's point will be it's these Democratic mayors. Do you want more Democratic people in government? Um, and you know, he can say with some accuracy, the president has very limited, uh, abilities here unless, you want to declare exactly the kind of state of emergency that I was pilloried for suggesting I might declare. Right, so why should I base my presidential vote on that? I th- I just think there's no substitute for seeming to be in charge of the pandemic and having a platform for your second term that's appealing. Yeah. Uh, and, and the main things to do there are uh, have some health care solution. He has no health care solution. Trump has no health care solution now. Move to the left on that. Uh, which was part of your appeal to begin with, and move to the left on the environment, and you know screw the donors, and you know it's better. That makes a whole lot more sense than moving to the left on prison reform how at many, a time of at the t- at a time of uh, increased violence. Hey, we let more felons out of prison. You know, even if they were nonviolent felons, it's just a discordant message. But how many people I, care a lot about the environment and have any chance in hell of voting for Trump? I mean, those just. Seems to me those voters are not getting Well, the, the for race him. is going to be decided in in the middle on uh, non college women and suburban moms. That's what everybody tells us, and the suburban moms might need something to salve their conference conscience to voting for Trump. And if Trump seems a little green, and if Trump also offers seems to offer some some solution for health care, I mean, and. Uh, seems to be open to ideas from the left, which always was part of his appeal before he decided to become the Paul Ryan president. Uh, uh, that might encourage suburban moms to give him a second look. Hmm. It's the best he can hope for. Yeah, I basically think it's either we have a Biden cognitive meltdown or we don't. It's going it's, it's mean, to it's add a lot of drama to these debates. I don't care. I'm resigned to Biden winning. All I care about the Senate. I don't want the Democrats to win the Senate. And the Republicans have this pathetic slate of candidates like Tom Tillis and McSally, who are just awful. And, you know, I, I wind up rooting for them to win. It's a terrible situation. That's the other thing the Lincoln Project did recently is run an ad trashing Republican senators for supporting Trump. Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio. It was music to my ears. Everybody um, except Mitt Romney. Yeah, was, because he's not because the theme of the ad was you caved to Trump. Romney voted for impeachment, right? It's bizarre. The theme theme of the ad seems to be we're throwing our weight around, and if you cross us and defy our orders to impeach Trump, we're going to destroy you with our Death Star like ads, and it, it's absurd. <laughs> well, I, I thought a lot of the early ads about Trump were of dubious value. In some cases, not that well done. But I'm warming up to these guys. I don't know, even though I don't uh, approve of them well, ideologically. Um, so you want to, you want to talk about the, 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 oh, go ahead. More politics. Steve Schmidt is not an aspiring, inspiring figure. George Conway, I give some now, He was a McCain to. guy, Steve Schmidt. He, he did a mediocre job on the McCain campaign. Yeah. And it's become like a hack. And he, then he went to work for, uh, didn't he go to work for the Starbucks guy? I mean, he's just a mercenary for hire at this point. I can think of worse people. The left loves him him because he trashes Trump. I don't know. So, should we talk about the Harper's letter? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, that leads right into the Harper's letter, which it seems to be a good, good letter. It was, you could, you could see 
how the signatures were gathered. You could see the David Greenberg network and the Ann now Applebaum that's... network. Uh, and, uh, you could see how they tried to balance it. They had a transgender person in there. They had a lot of blacks. It was very artfully done. I, I mean, I, I give them points for that. They didn't ask me. Why didn't they ask me? Was it something you it's said? Lucky I'm not resentful about that. I don't know. Didn't ask me. I don't think they asked. Well, I think, right. well, first of all, we should say, in case there's anybody out there who doesn't know what the Harper's letter is, it's an anti-cancel culture letter. And um, it actually, I've got this passage here where they, the closest they came to citing examples of what they're against, it says, editors are fired for running controversial pieces. That's a reference to James Bennett getting fired. Books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. Maybe that's the novel about the immigrants from Mexico. Well, uh, and there's a whole slew of young adult novels that got axed. Because, okay. Yeah. Journalists are barred from writing on certain topics. Could be a few things. Professors are investigated for quoting works of literature in class, uh, sur- presumably including quoting the N word if you're if you're reading Mark Twain or something. A researcher is fired for circulating a peer reviewed academic study. That's the guy who quoted the Omar Wasson study, just retweeted right. the damn thing and lost his job at a data well, analytics are, firm. I didn't realize they had so many examples. That's a bunch of examples. Last one is, and the heads of organizations are ousted for what are sometimes just clumsy mistakes. Um, so, yeah, it was these people standing up for, as they put it, free speech. Uh, the, uh, you know, by the way, this also follows nicely on the end of our last conversation because after we got, after we, press stop record you said with deep remorse in your voice oh damn it i forgot i wanted to trash yasha monk m-o-u-n-k however he pronounces it well and he was one of the main the main guys right in this i don't think he was one of the main four guys but he signed it and his whole network of people and he was very much in pushing it afterwards and criticizing separate magazine well he he seriously is worried about the threat of Autocracy, wait, but wait, my he's point got a whole him, magazine. He's got who is this guy? Where did he come from and why? I was totally unaware of him three years ago. I don't know. He got a hold of Slate and he started writing. This is my point. He started writing articles about how Trump was going to bring autocracy to America and we were people were going to be fired for, uh, for resisting Trump. Okay. And, and now he's saying, wait, the problem is cancel culture on the left without any mention that he was wrong before when he said, there, were go- there was going to be author- author- authoritarianism on, on, you know, from Trump. And he just sort of glided over that epic uh, error. Uh, and, uh, well, he'd ha- just he think- would have an answer if you confronted him. I mean, people well, never say Trump was incompetent. He how many was an people incompetent do you, authoritarian. How many people do you know who go around saying, before I express this opinion, I'd like to, you to know about some times I've been wrong in well, the past. Well, before you get on a big soapbox denouncing uh, you know, denouncing, uh, saying, you know, we have to resist Trump, uh, and in order to do that, we have to fight cancel culture. You should at least establish, you know, that you scared us last time and you were wrong. It's like, you know, you're okay. like the boy who cried wolf. Uh, so anyway, I, okay, I we call the fact on him. Mickey, it, let's, it, let's like, you and I like, sign a letter calling on him. To do that. It's, I've already tweeted. It's like Jeffrey Goldberg skating on the aflatoxin weapons of mass destruction. He was wrong about that. He never paid the price. Yeah, but this that guy, was flat this, out. This guy was, this guy was, was wrong about Trump. But that the was different. Autocracy has not taken over America and he hasn't paid any price about it. But that was different. Jeffrey Goldberg did seriously deficient reporting that was hugely consequential. Not just the thing you mentioned, but his piece in the New Yorker about how uh, Saddam Hussein was in cahoots with Al Qaeda on the basis of no credible evidence group. whatsoever. What? He was, he was coordinating with some obscure group that had some vague ties with Al Qaeda. I don't think that was true. It just wasn't enough to go to war over. No, no. This was what he reported was never established. What he yeah. reported was told to him. It's like hmm. these Kurds who wanted America to invade Iraq. Bring Jeffrey Goldberg to a room and right. say, there's some people we'd like you right. to talk to. And they say, we're prisoners and we know right. this. And, uh, well, it's, Goldberg it's, falls for it. Yeah. It's and weird. He's, he's running he the Atlantic now. He, as, didn't as, sign as, the, as he, didn't, he didn't sign the letter. Okay. Maybe he was asked. Maybe he wasn't. David Remnick, editor of the New Yorker, did not sign the letter. And I have a theory on that, which is the editors 
can't afford to sign that letter because they're terrified more than anybody else of being canceled. Now, an ordinary writer like Malcolm Gladwell or Yasha Monk could sign the letter because, you know, they don't have to please everybody. Uh, but well, David Remnick has to please everybody, including the, the woke millennials on his staff. He can't afford to sign that well, letter. Well, this brings us to the Ezra Klein Matt Iglesias subplot, right? Because Ezra is, he's no longer actual editor in chief of Vox, but as co-founder, along with Matt actually, <clears throat> and, and the main founder, um, and, and now editor at large, I don't know what kind of formal power he has, but obviously he still thinks of himself as naturally as the shepherd of the, of the flock, uh, or a, a shepherd, co-shepherd, something. So I, he, he, I'm sure he feels that kind of responsibility. And so what happened was, you know, Matt Iglesias signed the letter. And, and I thought one interesting thing about it was a few people of roughly Matt's ideological ilk were there who hadn't. I mean, remember, this whole thing kind of this used to be more of an exclusively intellectual dark web thing. These people of this particular ideology, in some respects, right wing and others not. Um, pushing this whole anti-social justice warrior, what they called pro uh, free speech agenda, I would say a broader array of people have become concerned about this issue, including people on the left like Glenn Greenwald. Um, and one interesting thing was like Matt was there, um, you know, Michelle Goldberg, a few other bona fide kind of uh, progressives. Noam Chomsky was one socialist on the letter, although you, you could have predicted that based on his past pronouncements. Anyway, so Matt, this got a fair amount of attention, but because Matt signed it, a, a, a staffer at Vox, a woman who is trans, I guess has transitioned, her name was Emily something? and. So. And, uh, lights into, writes, she apparently wrote a letter to, uh, the editor of Vox, uh, who is now an African American woman who complained that people were assuming, well, I'm getting ahead of the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, 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 um, but, uh, anyway, so, uh, this woman, Emily, um, complains about Matt having signed the letter. Uh, she publishes, she posts publicly a redacted version, apparently, missing some paragraphs, maybe, of the letter she sent to her editor. And, um, it's, it, it basically, it had, it, it had the key for, she insisted she likes Matt. She's not trying to get him fired. On the other hand, it had that vital phrase, made me feel unsafe in the workplace or something to that effect, which is famously a cause for firing right. people or suing them, right? right. And, and, uh, and she said the objection seemed to be that the letter, he signed it along with signers who were quote anti-trans, meaning like J.K. Rowling. She wouldn't describe herself that way probably, but she has run afoul of the trans community and made some kind of criticisms I'm not up on. Um, and the other thing she said was that the letter, uh, had anti-trans dog whistles. Now, I actually, did you see the tweet where I actually asked people to elaborate on, I, I asked for elaboration on what no. parts were in. and what was the answer? Because well, so I, I didn't see any. Emily had already signed off and said, look, I'm muting, have a nice day. She was already tired of all the blowback. Um, and, uh, but I did get some responses from people, including, um, uh, including some who, uh, including the last one person who was trans. I don't know if the person who supplied the examples was, but the two examples he gave me, let me see if I can uh, actually find them and quote from them. Okay, here's what he said. He said, a couple of the arguments, these are arguments from the letter, are frequently used to concern troll trans people. And then he quoted these two parts of the letter. One is, the way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not by trying to silence or wish them away. He seemed to think that was an anti-trans dog whistle, which struck me, you know, it's kind of surprising since that's used in all kinds of contexts, maybe right. including one involving uh, criticism of trans or something. But, and then the other quote was, journalists who fear for their livelihoods if they depart from the consensus. That's a fragment of a sentence. Um, and that's probably come up, uh, like, for example, one of the signers was Jesse Singal, S-I-N-G-A-L, do you know him? 
he's been very vocal on the trans front. He's expressed concern that uh, some people are transitioning, you know, uh, getting surgery uh, without having thought it through because there's peer group pressure or it's it's become a kind of faddish thing or whatever. I won't put words in his mouth. Um, and, and I suspect, I mean, who knows, maybe he's been cited as because the blowback he gets is a journalist who fears. For it. So, so I'm sure these things have been used in the context of trans debate, but it, it seemed to me they're both very kind of generic things that only a strained reading uh, yes. would render and, and, as and anti-trans sort of, dog whistles. It's, so, it's, so, it's, it's sort of solipsistic in a weird way. They, they think everything's about them, maybe. Well, I will uh, say, look, I don't, if there's, there's a lot of things I don't know what it's like to be black, gay, and so on. Rock star. But the thing, probably, I most don't know what it's like to be as trans. I mean, I really can't imagine what the kind of discomfort you would you would be living with to lead you to transition. I have no idea what the experience. I don't think you're allowed to say that, are you? Oh, you're not. Okay, well then, I just got canceled. (laughs) But but you know what, Mickey? You know what, Mickey? I don't have a boss. I don't have a boss. Tell tell me so I can't get fired. So I'm just going to repeat what I just said, Mickey. No, actually, I'm going to ask you how should I have said it. I oh, don't. No, is I, this everybody? People are are so wary of this subject; they're avoiding it. Uh, so, is gender uh, so gender dysphoria is a code word for? Is that an anti-trans dog whistle? That's a term you hear, right? That's only said by people I who ain't are saying anything. I was. <laughs> Come on, Mickey. I was, I've always supported you when you've said I was. I was operated on by a doctor who was in transition and. Yeah, but don't, Whatever. I mean, he, she did a very good job and my mother but, liked him and, and talked about how uncomfortable he must have been to be, ha, have had to make this transition. And I think that is an, exp- that is a sentiment you cannot express anymore. I think I, I'm my guess. I, what do I know? Oh, we'll ask people. So I'm staying away from it. But isn't it, isn't the person, doesn't the person it, formerly known as Bruce Jenner, can you put it that way? Say no, I, mean, I don't think you could say that. You've dead named him. Oh fuck, Her. man! I am just so they, out they, of it. This is this they, is people are just going to say, okay, great, and they're going to like like back away and and just not want anything to do with you. So if you and, dead anything name, you say could get you in trouble. What you mean if you mention the name? Beats me, Bob. I well, quit scaring nobody me. Nobody wants was, to deal with these people. Quit scaring the, the me on the thing, basis of limited the, actual the, the, knowledge. The interesting thing. The interesting thing is. Ezra and Matt have won, I think, because Ezra's, Ezra, like many whippersnappers, always wants to take things private. They don't like, that's what journalists was Wait, about. Have can the I argument. finish the point and finish the entire politically correct thing? All I was going to say was, uh, and this is logically prior to what you were going to say, which we'll get back to, although we should say you have had issues with both Matt and Ezra in the past, which I may plunge into in retaliation for you're just trying to cancel me it may not but I didn't try to catch you make no you, it was nice it was a friendly if thing you're to you warned me, me make your point you warned me that the electric fence was either an inch away or already making contact with me and i appreciate that i wish you'd said it a minute earlier but whatever the um no what i was going to say was and i have a question about her letter that part was okay right her letter the what I want to know is, was it really emotionally driven? And, and and what I was getting around saying was, for all I know was, I have no idea what what it would be like. In other words, look, one of the main things she objected to was just seeing the name J.K. Rowling and a couple of related names on the thing. That, that by her account, really kind of set her off. You're and I'm saying that because I, she's a woman, she's more emotionally driven. No, no, no. You because that gets again. me back. I mean, don't get me into trouble with whole new constituencies, Mickey. Let's. You've let, been canceled so many times you, you, in this. You're dialogue. trying to you're, like. You're trying to like. Just, you're trying to like quintuple. The at this point. You're, you're trying to quintuple the number of people who want to cancel me. You're okay? already dead, Bob. You might as well say what you think. <laughs> I'm saying it. Would you shut up? <laughs> what What I think is. What I, no, what I don't know is, was it, as some people suggested, a calculated opportunistic move? Like, this is my chance to, like, cut Matt off at the knees, 
get a lot of publicity, become famous. People were openly suggesting that on Twitter. Or was it authentically motivated? Uh, in, in, and this is what I was getting at in a way that I can't understand. I cannot, I, 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 I can't, I literally can't imagine like seeing J.K. Rowling's name and going, no, this is too much. But, but that's just because I've never been there. Okay. Now, in, th- in a just world, Mickey, you seem to be growing weary of me. You're shaking your head. You're looking down. Go ahead. Finish up. That was a passive aggressive form of encouragement. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> okay. Fine. Oh, fine. Look, you go. I, I'm sure it was having sincere. Yeah. And there are, you know, there are people, if I sign a petition and discover that uh, Richard Spencer's name was on it, I would be pretty right. pissed off too. So right. there are, it's not like you can never be pissed off because somebody else signed it, you know, but so I'm sure it was sincere. The interesting thing is, uh, Ezra with his, his tendency to always want to take things private actually succeeded because, uh, Matt is now, you know, he, Matt is now protecting this woman and saying, don't you dare attack my colleague. Uh, Emily, I think her name is. And uh, so that means he's won. If he's taking pity on her and protecting on her, that means he is in an invulnerable position now. And Wait, she is relying didn't, on him. You, to, you so. didn't tell this. I think people need more background. I, I don't think the Ezra Matt subplot is so widely known. Apparently, apparently Matt promised Ezra he wouldn't respond in kind and, you know, you know, attack his colleagues who attacked him. And he started tweeting only positive tweets. And uh, then well, Ezra sort of pontificated about free speech. And Matt said, can I respond? And OK, and, well, first. And, so anyway, it's it's the, the strategy of not responding in kind and sweeping it under the rug has been successful. The controversy okay. has tamped down. They're now in a solidarity like position of standing against outside critics. And it's all gone away, so it was effective. That's my that's my point. Okay, and just if people need the background, here's the Ezra. What happened was, she's said she's done this letter. People are talking about it. Oh, is Matt going to reply? Matt doesn't reply. Ezra tweets. A lot of debates that sell themselves as being about free speech are actually about power, and there's a lot of power in being able to claim and hold the mantle of free speech defender. So that seems like kind of a swipe at the people who signed the letter. Seems, if anything, you're coming out on her side and against Matt. Now, maybe Ezra thought of it as something that was sufficiently abstract that it was a way of weighing in without really taking sides. But Matt replied on Twitter, oh, uh, should I cite examples or do you want me to honor my commitment to you? Which was yeah. enticingly cryptic. Right. It turns out according well, to, and then Matt deleted the tweet. Then Ezra's yeah, subsequent yeah, tweet was, yeah. was like, um, explained, well, I've asked every, I've asked Matt and his colleagues not to subtweet tweet people, but I now realize my tweet was yeah. seen as a subtweet. It I would emphasize, I would never try to get Matt fired and blah, blah, blah. After which the current editor in chief complained yeah. that people didn't realize well, that she was saying, the one who had the power to fire. You said it turns out what? What, how does it, tur- what does it turn out? What, what did I say? You said it turned out and then you started to say something interesting and then digressed. It turns out. When did I say it turns out? Oh, no, anyway. Um, it this sounded is, like you, you you were privy to some some knowledge about goings on at Vox that we weren't privy to. I have not. I've gotten no uh, no intelligence but about the, that. You know, I'm you know the a, a, a the upshot is that Ezra could pontificate on the the topic of the day, which is the Harper's letter, but none of his employees would all be scared to talk about it. So that was sort of a a power move in itself, right? Uh, and the second thing is. Uh, of course we want to valorize, as Coleman Hughes pointed out, of course we want to valorize people who, who can be depicted as protecting free speech because we like free speech. So yes, that is a, you do get more power if you can be the protector of free speech. And as Jake Weisberg pointed out, is people who say it's all about power and not speech are usually the people who want to repress free speech because that's just a power move. So, um, anyway, so. Uh, reverse kudos to Ezra for that. Well, here's um, here's my question: Is should we see this as just all about power? And that reminds me. So one of our commenters had said, 
uh, this was a couple weeks ago, after we were talking about wokeism. Let's put it this way, very starkly. Wokeism is a function of demographic change and thus will continue to gain strength. This is how groups transfer power. The ascendant group lodges grievances, rewrites history, and vilifies the incumbent group. That's us, Mickey, the old incumbent group. Descendant, the descendant group, I think that's us too, loses influence with, with industry and is eventually ignored. Like, is it, is it that? I, I mean, that's like an admirably Machiavellian and kind of Marxist take. But do you think that it's, it's almost that simple? I mean, there weren't many young, like Matt is in his late thirties. There's probably nobody younger than him who signed the letter. Is 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 this fundamentally more generational than Barry, ideological? I think Barry Weiss is younger than her. Now that was probably a mistake to have her sign it. I got to say, they um, should. But I, I digress. Um, so, well, a couple things. First, I don't. They, I, I, I've been rendered. Uh, I've been ignored and rendered obsolete years ago. So, um, the second thing is, I don't think the boomers tried that. We tried that in the sixties. I don't think they were successful. Boomers didn't cancel the greatest generation because we didn't have the arsenal that the woke people have, which is saying it's racist and discriminatory and we're hurt and the whole safe space bullshit. So I think they have weapons that, that we didn't have pushing aside the predecessor generation. And we, in fact, didn't, uh, didn't we? Didn't push aside the predecessor generation. No, we didn't. I think well, I mean, there was. We I mean, look, they, look. When when the the TV show Archie Bunker. Now, I don't know what generation Norman Lear is in, but anyway, we, you and I were, you it's know, really, really old. Yeah, it's really old, but I mean, that's what that's when boomers were reaching adulthood, and there were boomers in their twenties and late twenties when Archie Bunker came on, and that show was a way of saying. You know, the way you guys have been talking, the way, you know, the way the older generation talks, we're going to ridicule that. It, it, was, it was very different in spirit from, but at the same time, it was defining that new bounds. Bad. It was defining new bounds. New was bounds a, were a, defined. It was a creative act by Norman Lear, who is 300 years old. Okay, and not well, what about this? Remember the Frito Bandito commercial? Vaguely, yes. Well, Frito had to withdraw it. Is that right. so different? I mean, new bounds were being drawn, but it, it wasn't the 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 millennials are being successful. I think we talked about this in ways that the boomers were not successful. So I, I sort of reject I, I reject this sort of boring idea that it's one generation just each generation supplants the other. That's also a, that's also an excuse. I I I I thought the whole I, I thought this was. Useful, maybe it wasn't the the whole Vox sort of attitude, which is we're explaining things to you, Bob, and you're and this is enough for you. We, you know, everything is okay once we've explained it. You should be satisfied, and there's no need to hear the other side because you know we've all explained it to you. That's we're the explainers, and um, that fits in with woke culture, which is there's no need to hear the other side, uh, and then the woke culture comes That's along good. and cancels the other side, as seems to be. Happening with, uh, my friend Heather McDonald when, uh, she is, she's been citing this academic study from the University of Michigan, I believe, that seemed to say that, uh, it was evidence that there was not racial discrimination in shootings. Now you, you think there would be, but this academic, his evidence suggested no. It was a couple of academics or maybe three. and And they, and they withdrew their study rather than have Heather cite, continue citing it. They withdrew it, and Wesley Lowry, who is Mr. Police Shootings, Black Lives Matter, former Post reporter, said, well, maybe now people will stop publishing that lady who says, uh, you know, that the, the, the there's a war on police, meaning Heather McDonald. And Wesley Lowry, he wasn't trying to ban her, but he clearly w- would wish she were sort of declared persona non grata and not publishable and would go away. He wanted the other side of the debate to go away. And that's a very... I think a sort of Vox like, Vox like attitude, which is we ignore the other side of the debate and just give you enough so you're satisfied and stay on our team. Uh, and, and that was the impulse. They don't want to hear the other side anymore. Well, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, I think strictly speaking, the Vox idea I thought was, was the idea of Vox was grounded in the, in the, I think, correct perception that people are more persuaded 
by pieces that they think of as kind of straight reporting or straight analysis than they are by pieces that are overtly opinion pieces. Right. Uh, that's smart. That's the way I do it. Um, you know, uh, I would, I would, you know, uh, so. But it, 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 if you read, especially Ezra's pieces on healthcare, as the, it was all like, oh, there's this problem with Obamacare, but don't worry. I've talked to Jonathan Gruber and this is why it's all going to be fine. Uh, it wasn't really a serious analysis of what the problem was. It was telling people just enough so that they say, okay, everything's fine. And they go and read something else. Well, anyway, on, on the on the Heather McDonald thing, and by the way, Glenn Lowry on Blogging Heads interviewed her not all that long ago, although before, well, it, it, he interviewed her saying the things that eventually led, apparently, these scholars to retract their paper. And that's the striking thing, is the, if it's true that all they wanted to do was disassociate themselves from this journalist who was quoting their work, this is a pretty extreme measure to retract an academic paper if well, it's true are. now they didn't say that what they said was our conclusions were too casually put and you know judging by the paraphrasal of them it did seem like there was a it was a it, it did have kind of a casual uh they sounded like they were being more sweeping in their conclusion than almost any data could warrant but maybe uh maybe if i read the whole paper which i haven't well, done first, i would first them. there was an, another official at the university of michigan who would uh, who, who was sort of semi canceled. He was stripped of his administrative position. Uh, and so there was, there was, what, he, was arguably, he a co-author? He was a co-author? No, I don't think so. There, there was arguably a, a certain amount of peer pressure put on them to do something. Uh, and, uh, I don't think Heather cited them fairly carefully. She said, she, she said it undermines the narrative. She did not say this proves that there's no discrimination. And in fact, it's sort of counterintuitive why you would think I would expect there to be massive discrimination in favor of whites in police shootings. And uh, there are sort of two kinds of evidence for that. One is you look at the number of the percentage of, you know, blacks killed and you compare that with the black percentage in the population. And it's way above that. But if you compare them with the percentage of blacks who are involved in violent crime, it's not way above that. So uh, even in their retraction, this author said, of course, it's an accepted academic fact that if you use these benchmarks, there's no racial discrimination. So that was in the retraction. OK, unless they're going to retract the retraction, Heather can cite that. OK, well, um, that's the kind of phrase that I thought was a little too casual. There's no racial discrimination. I mean, no, he no, they were they they. They said, looking at this set of data, there's no racial discrimination. They didn't assert evident in this. Yeah, data. I mean, it, 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 I I just think this thing about how they 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 reached an extra conclusion is is sort of bogus. I mean, they said they were obviously saying, based on our data, we find no evidence of racial discrimination. Okay, now Lowry claims they did find some, and there certainly is some. There are some fuzzy areas like shooting of unarmed people that tends mm. to be wildly. More blacks than whites. And also a lot of the whites who are shot are really suicides. They're, 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 they're committing suicide by cop. That seems to be a white thing, not a black thing. So maybe that gums up the statistics. So, but anyway, um, they, this, the one that was withdrew went about it a, a different way, which is they said, okay, we're just going to, how would the discrimination be? What's the mechanism? Well, it'd be because whites, Officers shoot blacks more than black officers. So they compared the race of the officers and they found that that made no difference. That obviously doesn't prove that there isn't a generalized, uh, you know, anti-black attitude among both white and black cops that, uh, discriminates against blacks. So yes, their, their study did not make the larger point. But in the course of their attraction, they say, well, there are these other stories that studies that do sort of make the larger point. So I, uh, I wish I, I wish I'd like to talk to these guys, but I'm sure they're lying low now. Yeah, it's it's it. it anyway, it's it, the, the, the disturbing thing is that Lowry sort of wished Heather would go away. And Heather's an honest journalist. She's making her points. You can argue. Wait, with this her. is who? Uh, oh, that Lowry, not Glenn Lowry. Wesley Lowry. You know, Wesley Lowry would just as soon Heather went away. She, she was it's annoying now, to have to argue against her. Now, didn't he write? That's the canceling impulse. Now, didn't he kind of relatedly write a piece saying, 
object you, journalists should should abandon the paradigm of objectivity and embr- and, and 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 just uh moral clarity or something should replace the uh well, that's- he probably did. That's that's fine as long as you don't abandon the, the I, I, objective I, I, of honesty. I, I, I disagree. I, I I think for so-called straight news reporters, um, the uh, there's there's merit in go and actually trying to get all sides of an argument and report them and present it um, as yeah. such personally. Or- that's fine too. I just don't bo- it doesn't bother me when people abandon objectivity because then they're just like people running for the new republic. But that doesn't mean you abandon, uh, yeah, you, you know, keep going back to that. Honesty. But I'm talking about newspapers, not the new republic. New republic well, is a difference? journal of opinion. It's different. You always say this. I'm why talking about new, pu- I'm talking about the New York Times. Journalists of opinion in the, in the pages of the Washington Post. Well, obviously they do, but that's supposed to be called the opinion pages. Who says it's, it's, it's well, again, yeah. my view is that there is merit in separating the two, even though I, I agree that the ideal of objectivity is not reachable. I just think there's virtue in trying to play by those rules. I also think you undermine your own credibility. I mean, don't you agree that the New York Times has undermined its credibility, led many people to no longer pay attention to what it says? Many of them happen to be on Trump's side, but whatever, by virtue of being so obviously biased in its purportedly objective coverage. Don't you agree with that? Yes. But that's- okay. Well, isn't that isn't that dumb from the New York Times' point? I mean, in some one sense, it's not. They're maximizing clicks. They're surviving for now. But aren't they undermining their credibility in the long run? Yeah, but that's and, a different point. And that's the Post is doing the same thing. It's exactly stupid to publish only New Republic style writers. Not that you can't publish New Republic style writers. And the, also, the other problem is they do the the journalist of journalism of opinion so badly. Uh, if they, in fact, you know, did it well, the New York Times might have a lot of credibility. If they had like a well-argued piece uh, using actual facts and being honest and dealing with the big arguments on the other side every day, they might have huge influence. They wouldn't be objective, but they'd have huge influence. Very hard to do that on a daily deadline. In fact, I don't think anybody can do that. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, on a, Bizarrely, Andrew Sullivan could do that. On a good day, he could go out and cover a demonstration and come back with a unobjective yet interesting factual account. But it's very, you can't do it day after day. It's just too exhausting. What? You can't do straight reporting day after day? No, you can't do journal of opinion reporting day uh. after day. It's, ba- it's bad enough to do, it's hard enough to do what Maureen Dow did, which is write interesting, good prose, making funny, ironic points with a, with a sort of tint of bias and irony. And sophistication every day that also gives you the facts. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's sort of those people are, are, are very rare. Maureen was one of them. Uh, and they burn out quickly. You can't do it every day. Well, she totally He's, should have stuck with what she was doing. It worked. She worked much better as a feature writer in that, in the straight news section as a, but a feature writer. Than as a columnist, it's, but it's unsustainable. IMHO. It's, it's physically unsustainable to go out every day and come up with a different take. It can't be done. It's beyond um, human. Then they capacity. should write less often. So tell me, the um, was the Harper's letter? Did it advance the cause it set out to advance, or did it? Because a couple of uh, signatories uh, disowned it, right? Like uh, totally one, one trans body. woman did, even though there are a couple of at least one trans people who are still signatories. Um, at least one trans person, I think, too. Um, and uh, and somebody else dissociated herself from it. But, uh, so what's your answer? Yes. we were, Last week we were talking about when will somebody come up with a sister soldier or somebody to say stop to the woke people. And this letter said stop. I think it was effective. The more controversy about it, the better. Okay. The, 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 people, the people withdrawing their names just prove the point. Did they? Well, they did. I mean, yeah. maybe logically you could say they did, but still they, they, they add to the appearance that the letter was kind of a debacle. I mean, and, and you know, I mean, people are saying, well, maybe they shouldn't have had these people sign it. They should have had, uh, and so on, uh, because they, they should, that you, you do, don't you want to avoid having people who signed the letter, uh, disown it? Any publicity is good publicity. No, not if, well, it's a, if it's a letter denouncing 
peer pressure that makes people change their mind and two people on the ladder itself succumb to peer pressure and change their mind, mm. that sort of makes the point. I'm trying to even more strongly. I'm trying to put my finger on why it is that like several years ago I was not really uh I, I was pretty dismissive of concerns about cancel culture um i I mean and i do think the problem on campus was somewhat overstated there weren't that many um there weren't that many cases where like the charles murray case uh where where you actually get assaulted i only know of one assault in fact that i can think of and and so on because it ramped up with trump it 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 exploded with trump yeah i mean there was there's an article in the new york times about some restaurateur who said who who has a black lives matter sign in his window but but voted for Trump and the, the New York Times correspondent said, as you would expect, nobody people stopped patronizing his restaurant. Yeah. As you would expect, when before Trump we wouldn't expect not patronizing the restaurant just because the owner voted for somebody we didn't like. I mean it's all been magnif cathected a hundred percent by Trump. The question is, once Trump is gone, well, will it an go interesting away? Take because the interesting people, thing is, will it go away once Trump is gone? I mean, people were complaining answer. about it before Trump. So that's an interesting take, and maybe that's it. I mean, part oh. of it also, I'm actually getting older. And, and you know, uh, part of it is, honestly, you know, the, the, our whole exchange about what you, you can and can't say about trans people. It is genuinely difficult if you just came of age a long time ago. It's genuinely difficult to remember all the stuff, to absorb and remember uh, the appropriate ways of talking. And um, it, when there are this many of them right. and they're this subtle and the idea that you can get into serious trouble for screwing That's up once. That's the idea, though. The idea is that it's so complicated that the boomers can't remember it, so they get canceled. But again. The, the, well, it, that's an interesting point I, that I wanted to get to because um, – I was complaining, I was, I was, I was hope, mockingly whining about how they would never think of asking me to sign this thing. But, um, the serious point is, uh, I'm, I'm now in a sort of position where I haven't published in the mainstream media for a while and I'm too lazy to go through that. And mm-hmm. I have my own alternative ways to get my writings out with a newsletter and with this. Uh, and the question is, uh, am I, I, I think that's, that's a stupid way to go about it. In other words, I don't want to be one of these people who just has a newsletter who's a crank, uh, way over, you know, on the, on the fringes. And I think you still need the imprimatur of establishment journalistic organizations, at least every now and then. Uh, and you, and- you want to be a crank who's being published by respected. Well, the, 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 I guess the question is, is it possible to be a crank and actually have influence on policy without being published by the Washington Post and New York Times? Or even getting your piece on real clear politics. Does Frank and, Gaffney get published in the Washington Post? I mean, who are some flat out crazy cranks? Well, they, if Frank Gaffney, Gaffney has, I don't, I, the answer, that's a good, I, I, I wouldn't, he Gaffney goes on, he probably goes on Fox. Um, it, more people have been canceled than you think, but, the, the, is, well, is that's it, right. I mean, it's a subtle thing. That's the thing. It, 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 it's not always an actual firing. Is there really an alternative way of getting your ideas injected into the po- policy debate around the former gatekeepers? And I just actually don't know the answer to that question. I don't know, but it, this is such a perfect time for a commercial break. Your newsletter is called Cows Files, and people should uh, subscribe at, at uh, Google Cows Files and Substack. Mine is called Nonzero. They can go to nonzero.org. And I'm not, I, I, and you know, they can, uh, they can support both the newsletter and this, and all the Blogging Heads podcasts, uh, by going to Patreon, uh, Googling Patreon and Nonzero Foundation. But I'm not really just kidding. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I guess I won't get into that, but I, I do, um, you know, you want to have your own, you want to have your own thing. It's partly just a, a temperamental disposition. Uh, you know, you'd rather have your own thing. You'd rather not have to put up with a lot of editing, but there are, especially, I will say, co- especially copy editing, actual, 
Actual well, actual good editing saves you and, and makes the piece better. Well, good copy editing can be a pleasure. I mean, I remember I, when, when I used to close pieces at I Time Magazine that. and the New York Times, and they had really good copy editors. And, and you would be like on the phone killing time waiting for somebody to get through with the art or something, and you'd have these pleasant conversations with them. They were nice people. But um, the good, a good but, but editor let me just say, is, Yeah, go ahead. Well, go ahead. No, I insist. A good editor is like Andrew Sullivan. He says, fix this one paragraph. It'll be fine. You have another one next week. That's, that's a, that's a good edit. Yeah. A bad edit it is there. I thought of 15 different ways your piece is wrong and you could never satisfy them before a deadline, but I'm really smart and I thought these things were wrong with your piece. That's a disaster. The number of great editors does seem to be diminishing, but that could just be me, uh, my increasingly warped view talking. But anyway. I do want to say, I, I do hear more and more people saying, largely in response to cancel culture, I want to build my own boat. I mean, I want to do a news. Tons of people are doing it. Some people are having great success. Matt Tybee, who nominally could have been a signatory of this letter. He was supportive of it, so far as I can tell. He's on the left. Um and has been pretty ruthless in criticizing a number of things, including the book White Fragility. Uh, but he's having huge success with his uh, newsletter, I think, and there's a paid version of it. That's true, uh, because he's a he's he manages to overwrite without it seem overwriting. He's very talented in that respect. Well, also he he has preserved just enough of the you know he was an he inherited Hunter Thompson's spot. For a long time, he was the Rolling Stone kind of, I guess, chief oh, politics okay. reporter. And he's inherited that kind of uh, hyperbole that Thompson employed very amusingly. He doesn't do it exactly the way Thompson did or quite as much, but he employs hyperbole he, well. He's a good example of if he succeeds, then he's showing that it can be done. Yeah, but he's got such a natural. Well, does he? I, I, he's got kind of a natural tribe. He's a great. He's a great writer. He's very. He's a very. Uh, if he's, I don't think. I'm a, I, I would like to think that if he succeeds, I can. But I don't. I don't think that's true. I think if he succeeds, he can succeed. No, but he, if he succeeds, somebody can succeed. Somebody, yeah. It's not. It's not one impossible. of these young, productive people. Yeah. The the um, kind who are pushing us aside. As part of the. Uh, the kind of canceling us. You've been canceled, Bob. This is your afterlife. You're like a zombie. That's the okay. thing. It really let is. It, I mean, let this it rip. is You're dead. this is a perfect example of the problem. It's like you you make a perfectly earnest, well intentioned series of utterances, and some guy comes along and says, you're, "You know that syllable there? This is, the guillotine's this is, over here." Bob, you're looking at weeks and weeks of. Uh, of sensitivity training and confession and you have gone to sen- you've self, had that self criticism sessions no but if you want to aren't redeem they called your name, struggle sessions aren't they called struggle they sessions they may be now in the chinese in the in the cultural in, revolution in the cultural I revolution they were, were self criticism i think but oh i thought they were struggle sessions never mind um um uh, anyway um so wait do we want to say anything else about this this could be our last podcast because you know, as you know, it's your last podcast. Wait, Bob. was I this your I didn't bid? Make that error. Was this your bid? Was this your power play? The whole thing. You're um, employing cancel culture to unseat. There me. you go. I'm, I'm next week. They're going to see just Mickey. <laughs> exactly. So should we talk uh, about Epstein? I mean, oh, you're, you're, you you want it to end with your secret Epstein theory? Yeah. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I want to apologize to Bill Clinton. Uh, I noted that according to Maria Farmer, the one of the victims of Epstein, who who has actually done interviews that are public, um, he visited the Epstein mansion a couple of times in 1996. Uh, and obviously there's innuendo. It's like, hmm, you know, it was a big event. Every all the staff has to leave. I would just like to say that it's entirely. There have been reports that he was having an affair with Ghislaine. It's entirely plausible that that's what he was doing at the mansion. Now, you may ordinarily you don't defend a person by saying they were having extra having an extramarital affair with uh, with anybody, but this would be much better than um, 
than some other things you can imagine him doing at the at the at Jeffrey Epstein's mansion. What? So I'm going to leave open that possibility. Um, okay. That, uh, do you have any comments? Sure. Um, I, I full disclosure: Bill Clinton once said some nice things about a book I wrote. So there. So you're defending him by saying he had an affair with Jelaine Maxwell. <laughs> right. I'm paying him back. With he said a lot of like nice you. things about Non-Zero, and it's finally come back. <laughs> It's finally time to, I, to to pay him back, and, and I just want to say he may have been having an affair with Ghislaine Max. I I I have no evidence that he pursued underage women. No, I don't either. Some people say he was in the presence of underage women. That's different. Mm. Uh, and so, and, and bizarrely, this uh, for this alleged quadruple murderer who Epstein supposedly confessed to, one of the confessions was, you know. I could never get Bill Clinton to go for those underage women. He liked older women. Really? So, uh, yeah. So either that was a plant by Bill Clinton's people or by the National Enquirer or who, who the hell knows, but it was exculpatory of Clinton, bizarrely. That makes sense. So uh, anyway, my, my, my theory, uh, is, uh, it's not a theory, but. I, I think the, the the speculation about who had a motivation to kill Jeffrey Epstein has tended to focus on people that he would have dirt on, right? People he's he had videos of, pictures of, he knew that they Correct. had done these. Correct. Okay. George, George Mitchell being the biggest fish there. Okay, fine. Here's the name I think should be added to the conversation, not because Epstein had compromising information on him. Conceivably, he could have, but in a way that's unlikely. And that is... Wait, will I get sued or something? Last time you didn't stop me soon enough. You didn't stop me soon enough when I when I ventured into cancel territory. Are you are you going to stop me just, now? I don't know what you're going to say. Um, it's it's your, um, your last chance to stop me. <laughs> you're saying Les, you're saying Les you're saying Wexner. This, you're saying, Les Wexner. You think According, it's news that Les Wexner was involved in the Epstein no, scandal? No, 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 no. But the point is, his concern, according to Maria Farmer, he was like the head of the snake. Epstein right. was mid-level management. So it's not, uh, Les Wexner's concern wouldn't be that, that Epstein has pictures of him. It's that it would be disclosed that he was running the whole operation. That's a different kind of motivation to have Epstein killed. And let me add something. Right, but, uh, let me add one thing before you try to come up with uh, countervailing evidence. Um, Maria Farmer seems convinced that there was a big, if I'm recalling this interview correctly, I don't think it was just the interviewer that interjected this. She seemed convinced that there was a big organized crime element here. There was a big intersection with organized crime. Well, if so, and she's right about Wexner being the head of the snake, he's deeply involved with organized crime. And when you think about it, if you ask like Prince Andrew or even Bill Clinton, how do you get somebody killed in prison? They don't have a whole lot of experience. But if you're, but if you're like this with organized crime, you know exactly who to call. And, 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 I, uh, I, 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 I just I would throw that out I, there. I, I'm going to get I sued. I haven't seen any evidence that Wexner knows. What about organized crime? It is possible that Wexner. I'm if just, we think it was a Mossad operation, it's possible that Wexner was running the operation. People are people are trying to figure out what what was motivating Wexner. Why do you just give this guy the biggest, you know, the biggest townhouse in New York? It which, makes no which, sense at all. Which again, I, if I'm recalling her t- her interview accurately, was already equipped. When he gave it I, I, somewhere, I got the clear idea. It was already equipped with all that surveillance stuff uh, uh, to video everything that happens in every room. So, so I do th- again. Whatever the reason he did it, um, and, you know. And here I would again not necessarily buy into Maria Farmer's speculations because they were informed by things Galen apparently said to her, which, as I said last week, something some some of which seem so conspiratorial that they almost could have been planted by Ghislaine to discredit her in the event that she starts talking. What, what Wexter's been very opaque, and, and one would like to get an honest answer from him about what he thought he was doing. I don't think you're going to get it. I do think Epstein had connection to organized crime. Uh, oh. One of the reasons why well, I was, I was w- reluctant to do some things about Epstein because I thought he would know who to call to get a journalist killed. So, um, 
Uh, yes, I think that's, that's, that's clear. I know Wexter, I don't know about, but I think Epstein would know about it. And, uh, that's, that's another, another, um, possible aspect is the whole money laundering aspect. You know, last week I, last week I dismissed the money laundering aspect because I didn't think Epstein put enough work even to be a money launderer. I now sort of take that back. Uh, it's a theme of the National Enquirer reporting is that he was involved with money launderers. Well, you uh, know, again, it's the National Enquirer. Who knows? But I do think there's an Epstein crime connection that hasn't been explored. Yes. Well, I will say this. You know, the Netflix documentary begins with uh, <laughs> this Vanity Fair story from around 2003 that uh, was going to feature Maria Farmer and her sister and blow the whistle on Epstein, at least, or, or at least record their claims. And the reporter, a, a, a British woman, I think, um, uh, submitted the story and had the stuff in it. Eventually, Graydon Carter took it out. And according to this reporter, in the meanwhile, Graydon Carter found in front of his house, A, the severed head of a cat, and B, a bullet on his porch. Huh. So, um, there, so, Vicky so Ward that. has written about, about Vicky that Ward decision. is the woman. That's the woman. Um, she, so she wound up running that van, she wrote the Vanity Fair piece that wound up not having their claims. Right, right. Um, I believe that. Okay. Um, but, uh, anyway, the, you're right that the average person would not know who to call and Bill Clinton probably would not know who to call to get somebody killed in prison. But they may not have had to call anybody. Like we said, the, the, the gang could have just decided, well, we don't like child molesters, right? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm not even a hundred percent sure, I guess, that Epstein didn't commit. I'm not a hundred percent sure that Epstein didn't commit suicide, but, but my estimate of chances have grown. Yeah, you know, I think I heard a report that Ghislaine is wearing paper clothes in prison because they're afraid of suicide that's kind of ominous yes well of course you'd be afraid of suicide I well mean, okay then she, like do she's something like actually- a king and now she's now she's in this uh you know this horrible prison yes looking at a life in prison yes it's uh even if she even and even if she tells everything uh you know people are out to get her for the rest of her life she needs a new identity she yeah. her, she she's her behavior is a little bizarre unless she's talking, been talking to them for months. Uh, why did she think she, she was, she really believed this argument that, uh, she had a good double jeopardy claim because the initial deal with Epstein sort of protected her and they weren't, they weren't going to be able to charge her. I mean, she might win on that, but that's not enough to stay in the country. You can't rely on that. So well, it's, hard, may, it's hard to get out of it. She may not be as smart as we think she is. It's not It's not always easy to get out of a country if you're already there. Believe um, me, we may find that out. I mean, if Trump gets reelected, somebody pointed out that now with the pandemic, it's a lot harder to, you know, they won't let us in Europe. Where am I going to go? You get in a car and you drive to the Canadian border. It takes you six hours. They may not let us in, man. The Canadian border is unguarded. You just drive across. So how long have we been at this today, Mickey? An hour and 40 minutes. Close to our record. Let's stop. Hey, that was kind of a defeated... You said that was a defeated air. Okay, sorry. Um, um, I didn't get my... I didn't get enough sleep last night. Yeah, me either. You, um... But we should plug more stuff. Your Twitter handle. <laughs> Your Twitter handle is at Kaus Mickey minus at Robert Ryder. The other thing is, I keep, I keep forgetting to mention this at the beginning of the show. Reminding people to click the like button if they're watching on YouTube, which is great insofar as it goes, but if you wait until now, how many people are still with us? I'm I'm allergic to all these plugs. The thing I hate about podcasts is there are too many plugs. Oh, but we're relatively light on the plugs. Give me a break. I'm not exactly P.T. Barnum here. <laughs> Nobody's ever oh. accused me of that. Well, fair enough. You're not but, even Scott, you're not even Scott Galloway. And have we quit entirely? Quit entirely? Quit discussing the usual things like podcast, I, podcast name. I sort of like the Parrot Room. I, I and I like Boomer Doomcast, except I think it's probably too downbeat. Who wants to 
sign up for a Doomcast. My daughter said she liked it, but if she were a marketing person, she would advise against it, which thankfully she's not. You know what's a really stupid name, Bob? I've got a feeling this is going to be an insult. Go ahead. No, the Beatles. Yeah, Beatles exactly. So you really never know. St- really stupid. It really name. is bad. <laughs> so it it doesn't matter that much. Um, but so you could you could talk me into anything at this. It's point. it's all about the quality of content. Well, Dude, how about Bob is canceled? We can call it the Bob is canceled. Cancel Bob podcast. Quit saying that, man. Quit saying that. This is a this is a terrifying atmosphere we live in. I'm terrified. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I guess not. So we're not going to talk about monetization or anything. Oh, I know. I got to show you my uh, cool graphs quickly. Quickly, I did this ingenious thing. Okay, top line is deaths per day divided by ten. Which has the virtue of, of bringing the amplitude down right. to a level that's comparable to the next curve, uh, the, the curve below it, which is, I showed a version of this last week, but I want to add something. The, uh, the curve below it is, uh, new cases. And no, wait, it's the other way around. It's, it's new cases is the top curve. Um, and that's divided by 10. And so they're both on the same scale here. And then below it, uh, is deaths. Right. Guess we're going down. You can skip this little hump, which is a statistical anomaly owing to New Jersey. You have to raise the paper a little. You can't see the little uh, okay. hump. There you go. Yeah. So there. Okay. So you see that. And then I thought, well, but wait, there's this lag effect. So I figured, what happens if you move that curve, the cases curve, um, like 12 days forward in effect, so that what you're seeing, if you go straight down is you're comparing new cases uh, with deaths 12 days later, which means about, on average, probably three weeks after actual infection, right? right? Still get a huge gap, man. But, but the gap is closing. The deaths are starting to rise. So. That is the scary thing. And if what's happening is that uh, uh, it's moving from younger to older people, the cases, then I'm worried. So I may want to withdraw my earlier suggestion from last week that that average the seven day rolling average won't get back up to a thousand it maybe could okay okay um it's been nice knowing you i really enjoy i've enjoyed this this is you don't joke about these things mickey we're talking about a man's life and career his livelihood um okay sorry okay i'll i'll see you next week if there's yep if i'm here okay okay see you